Okay, so I've taken the document camera from one room and I've moved it to another because there's professors in there and I'm having a hard time. In the middle of the semester, they change the schedule of who gets what rooms. This is a different room. This is Pastor 214 on the second floor of the building that holds most of sciences and I guess social sciences. Where was I? Well, let's see. Clearly, we've done carbohydrates, soluble water, and we've done lipids. And lipids are any species or any chemical that comes from a plant or an animal that when you grind up the plant or an animal and dissolve it in a non-polar solvent, it's a recurring theme, Hexane is a non-polar solvent, like gasoline, which would be a non-polar solvent. Um, whatever dissolves in the non-water phase is going to be a lipid. Three types of lipids, well four, I talk about waxes, and I talk about um, fats. And the fats had the three long chains on them, three esters, triglycerides, glycerides, and then I did phospholipids. And what the phospholipids were are they look like a fat for two of the chains, but the third uh, place where you'd expect to see a chain, you see a phosphate head, and that makes the cell walls. So with that in mind, we need to talk about proteins. Now, recurring theme. If I have, let's say, and I know I can't go this high as something bright, I'm looking at the monitor, so student set, and I can't go this high for something bright, and I can go as far as this, so I will stay away from this area up top here. Good. Anyway, here's a molecule. It's got an N and H and H, and I'm drawing it this way on purpose, and then I could write CH2 C double bond O, OH. If a person were to say, what functional groups do you see in here? This side is an amine. If you had a nitrogen that was next to a carbon with a C double bond O, it would be an amide. But this carbon does not have a C double bond O on it. And this is a carboxylic acid. So this is an amino acid. That's an amino acid. Now, I'm going to not write both of these hydrogens here, although there's clearly two. One bond to the nitrogen, one bond to the carbon, one bond up to a hydrogen, one bond down to a hydrogen. I'm going to write it generically with just one, and I'll leave this spot open for something. What could this something be? If this something was a hydrogen, that would be different than if this something, let's say, like right over here, was N H H C H go down to a C H three C double bond O. Am I still online? Good. O H. This would be a different molecule. The backbone would be the same. It would have an amine on this side. It would have an acid on the other side. But what comes down here changes which amino acid it is. Now I'm going to post online, or at least I'll tell you what page in the book to look at for your 20 major amino acids, because the amino acids are strung together to make proteins and other things. Like an enzyme that we talked about last week is actually a bit of a protein in some respects. But Dependent on what's going down there, if I were to have just an H, this would be called glycine. Could that be acronym GLY? If I have a CH3 or a methyl coming down, this is alanine. And this would be ALA. I looked that up to make sure I have that right. And to make a long story short, 
No, it's not alanine. Oh, yes, it is alanine. Good. So, what can we say about this? When I had you do a condensation polymer, I had you take an alcohol and a carboxylic acid and circle water and then glue it together. And that became a chain. So the rule was a carboxylic acid plus alcohol made an ester bond. So that was in the polymer chapter. And it becomes big in some of uh, putting sugars together, et cetera. But an acid and an alcohol made an ester condensation becomes big in biochemistry. Well, now I have an amino acid. It's an amino acid because it has an amine on one side and acid on the other. They differ by what's sticking down here. But hopefully you can see that a person could circle water. If I gave you this amino acid and this amino acid and I asked you to write the product, you do like you did with the carboxylic acid and the alcohol when you did the polyesters or those uh, condensation polymers, pull out water, glue this nitrogen to this carbon. So let's do that. I've got one board to work on. I'll name this on top now. So this is glycine. This is alanine. If I take out the water, I do condensation. You write everything you had before. N H H goes to C H with an H coming down. C double bond O. Now glue this nitrogen or bond this nitrogen to this carbon, and you will have a nitrogen still with one hydrogen on it, and then a C H and then the C H three coming down, which is what made this guy alanine, as opposed to having the H coming down, which made it glycine. And then you have C double bond O O H. In this case, before at carboxylic acid and an alcohol made an ester, now carboxylic acid and an amine, that's an amide. So this is an amide bond. Now, this is a small, it might be called a peptide, but actually they call the amide bond a peptide bond. So what's important about here? Well, a lot of things are important about this, but amino acids condense and bond through or to each other with a peptide bond. And a peptide bond is an amide bond. There are other amino acids. There are many other amino acids. But if you have an amino acid that um, puts you to sleep on Thanksgiving, it's called tryptophan. Uh, that's got a much different, larger thing down here on the bottom. So you can get that from um, eating turkey, or you can get it from warm milk. They always would say that if you want to go to sleep, drink some warm milk. When you heat up whole milk, I don't think it would work with skim milk very well. Don't know that for a fact, but if you heat up whole milk, uh, what happens is it releases a tryptophan and it might make you a little bit sleepy. It's definitely not that strong of something that puts you down to set it. So what's important to this? A long chain of amino acids is called a protein. Your muscles are proteins. Your heart is a protein in a lot of respects. But um, in order to grow your muscles, if you were to just say, well, I want to become a big bodybuilder or something, and you wanted to like take a powder that was pure amino acids, the 20 amino acids that are uh, most important for biological life, 
just by taking them doesn't mean you're going to like get a muscle. You have to actually exercise and then these get knit together for you. Now, if you were to go on a diet without carbohydrates, like we spoke about last time, carbohydrates hold water on them. Your body wouldn't be able to get glucose and when your body doesn't get glucose, it has a choice, not much of a choice, it has fat and it has proteins, and your bodies will actually scavenge the protein and leave the fat alone. The fat's extremely important to your body to protect it. So hopefully this makes some kind of sense, the idea that amino acids, I'd like you to know the structure of an amino acid, how it differs from, let's say, a steroid or from a fat or from uh, the carbohydrates. You should get the shape of these things down. But to make a long story short, when you have this amino acid and that amino acid, you make a small little peptide with a peptide bond. And the more you have, at some point, you make this long polymer. So I would say a protein, a protein can be thought of as a polymer of amino acids. The different amino acids, and that's where the genetic diseases come from. Um, you could have some diseases that you can get from eating too much sugar and not processing your sugar well, or from having too much fat in your bloodstream. But sometimes, sadly, a baby can be born with one amino acid in a chain of 100 amino acids wrong, and that might be something that makes the molecule not behave well. So a genetic disease would be like sickle cell anemia. It's a very sad thing. Uh, there might be reasons why uh, if you have one marker for a genetic disease, you might be better in that part of the world where you're coming from uh, against malaria or something like that. But if two people with those markers get together, sometimes their child is not able to, uh, to breathe well because they can't have uh, the amino acids correctly sequenced so that they could process the oxygen in their bloodstream. Lots of sad things with genetic diseases. So, done all the uh, basic molecules, the biochemical molecules. Now I want to put two of them together and speak of something. my pen out. Hopefully you can guess what this type of molecule would be. A lipoprotein. It's got two classes of biological molecule together. It doesn't have any carbohydrates. It has a lipid and a protein together. There are two major types of these lipoproteins. The lipid side, of course, is going to be a certain type of lipid. It's going to be a steroid going with the protein. The two different types, you have high density lipoprotein and then you have low density lipoprotein. The acronyms would be HDL and LDL. L look like the other L. HDL and LDL. The HDL lipoprotein does something and the LDL lipoprotein does something. The HDL transports cholesterol to the liver to be removed. 
So hopefully this is ringing a bit of a bell with heart disease and having too much of a certain type of cholesterol. The HDL cholesterol, I'm sorry, the HDL high density lipoprotein transports cholesterol to the liver to be removed. The liver is something that gets rid of toxins in your body. The LDL one does something important too. The LDL transports cholesterol in bloodstream to make cell walls. And if you had no cell walls, that would be a bad thing. So LDL cholesterol is doing something good and HDL is doing something good, but most of your disease, well not most, but a lot of your diseases that don't come from stress or genetics, etc., might come from overnutrition, we say. So to make a long story short, if you have too much of the LDL cholesterol, they say that's the bad cholesterol. And the bad cholesterol will cause hardening of the arteries. I'll try to spell this right word right. So hardening of arteries. And the condition is called A-T-H-E-R-O-S-C-L-E-R-O-S-I-S, -E -E I hope. I have a list, I have a hard time saying this, arterial, arterial sclerosis. But you can think of that as hardening of the arteries. Why does the average person have to worry about hardening of the arteries? Well, it's a sad way to die because you may be completely healthy before you die of it. But these are the blood clots that cause stroke or heart attack. And when you have a stroke or a heart attack, you're not getting oxygen, especially for the heart attack, you're not getting the heart uh, oxygen into your heart and your heart muscle easily gets very sick and gets very damaged and it's hard to bring it back. I knew somebody in my family, I have eight brothers and sisters, so there's so many people in my family. I'm the last of nine children, but I knew somebody whose husband, one of my sister's husbands, he was completely healthy, he thought. He was a runner and jogger and everything else you could possibly be, but he was having a hard time breathing, so he went to the doctor and the doctor did some tests, had him on a treadmill. He said, well, get off the treadmill. He got off the treadmill and he said, well, why don't you just sit down for a second? And then all of a sudden a stretcher came in and he said, why don't you just get on the stretcher? He was about to have a heart attack and he didn't know it. Because they were able to open up his arteries to make sure that he didn't have a heart attack, he had no real ill effects because he never had the heart attack and he never damaged his heart. If you have the heart attack, that's when you damage your heart. And it's always uh, one of the sadder things the unfair things in the in the male versus female thing, a man classically is going to have pain down his arm. It's going to be pretty obvious. I know they always say it seems like an elephant sitting on your chest. Women can have a bit of a heart attack for an entire day. They could just feel really, really sick like they have the flu. And that entire time, they're damaging their hearts. So with women, they don't, you know, with men, you seem to know right away that guy needs to get to a hospital right now. With a woman, she, she might feel she's just like under the weather or something. And that's actually quite sad because once you weaken yourself, it's very hard. You, you would need like a new heart at some point. Same thing with strokes. If you don't actually have the stroke, if you can keep the blood flowing, you're in great shape. So what do we do? Well, we treat the symptom. And how do we treat the symptom? We probably tell the person to get a better situation going with their cholesterol intake and how much fat they take into their bloodstream, et cetera, et cetera. But most of the time, if you think of hardening of the arteries, here's an artery, or it's just two lines, and it's got some clotting going on here, some plaque, and the blood has to travel through. We may not actually deal with the plaque. We might just thin the blood. So people go on blood thinners and blood thinners, uh, 
they were a miracle for us. I remember uh, when my father finally stopped working after working his entire life. He quit at 62. He was a gardener outside, a very strong outside kind of a man. And he always said, I don't want to die in the job. I don't want to fall down and die in the job like everybody else. Today, because of blood thinning drugs, men live much longer. And because we live much longer, we, we got something we didn't even really know about before. Men would usually die in the early 60s, women would live longer, and there'd be a whole retirement thing going on there. That's why Social Security was set for a certain age, and now it's a bit of an issue. To make a long story short, people now, as men, they live longer and they get prostate cancer. And before, you live like my dad actually died of prostate cancer in his 80s. Uh, but he never would have gotten the prostate cancer had he not had the blood thinning drugs and not had the heart attack. Not that he would have had a heart attack, but he was the kind of person who could have had a heart attack. So I do want you to know about uh, HDL and LDL cholesterol. You're going to hear about it from your doctors. They're going to give you your blood numbers all the time. Persons should know about high density lipoproteins, low density lipoproteins. You want to increase the high density lipoprotein. Understand the concept of the blood thinner. Know that a heart attack and a stroke are a blood clot. One for the stroke is a blood clot going to the brain, the other one's going to the heart. All right, what do we have next? Yes. Just to review something that I know I have in my notes. I remember saying it to you. If you're curious, like you know what a fat is, you know the structure. You know what an amino acid and a protein is, you know the structure. But when I said an enzyme, I said an enzyme does something or catalyzes a biochemical reaction, RxN, inside of the body. If you're curious, enzymes are mostly protein made, mostly small proteins. They're just not really long chains and they do something, but you might be wondering what they're actually made of, okay? So, an enzyme, some need helpers, we did this already, and some don't. And the ones that need helpers need a cofactor. And the cofactor, if it's a metal, we say it's coming from a mineral. Because our metals are found in rocks in the ground. Kentucky clay has a lot of aluminum, that kind of thing. And if it's an organic molecule, then we call it a vitamin. And the enzyme won't work without it. Something else I did say about enzymes too. Hormones turn enzymes off and on. We use drugs to do this. So much of drug therapy is to turn on pain, to turn off pain, hopefully not to turn on pain too often, but most of drug therapy is to control enzymes like hormones do naturally. So hormones are like synthetic drugs, and well, our drugs are like synthetic hormones, I need to say. With that in mind, I want to talk about vitamins. Because people take vitamins, and in a balanced diet, You basically get most of the vitamins you need. But if you're not getting a balanced diet, there are things you can do. So basic nutrition. Let me erase. And what I do, what I've done my entire life, I drink in the morning for breakfast and ensure or something that might, you might think of like a boost nutritional drink. Because I never know 
which one of the vitamins I might be missing that day, so why not just do it? And I started doing that as a child. My parents would bring home uh, used, old, uh, not used, but old, uh, outdated insurers uh, from where they worked. And we were very poor, and it seemed to really help me as a child stay alive. So, first of all, vitamins. There are fat-soluble and you can overdose on these. And then there are water-soluble. You can't overdose on. Take a lot of a water soluble vitamin too much, you'll just probably, as they would say, urinate it out. So, some of the different vitamins. Under the fat soluble ones, vitamin A. Good for eyes, bones. Skin. Also, anti cancer. But if it's fat soluble, you can take too much. For water soluble, we start there. The B vitamins. So you might hear about a B complex. How many are there? There's eight B vitamins, apparently. What I have written. And what do we have? Good for skin and nervous system. Okay. Another water soluble one, vitamin C. We know a lot about vitamin C from our citrus drinks. Heals wounds. Still writing on the board, good. Heals wounds, uh, antioxidants. You think of that as anti cancer to stop a free radical mechanism from happening inside your body. They, it's, a, it's a long chemical process, but it's called an antioxidant, but you think of more of anti-cancer. And of course, good for the immune system. Often people say you just load up on vitamin C when you have a problem with your health, uh, with your immune system. Next one, fat soluble. Vitamin D. Now, it doesn't come from the sun, but it does suck. It's not like the sun is actually radiating vitamin D, this organic molecule to you. But it does have a reaction uh, that, that is, is catalyzed by the sun in your skin, etc. And vitamin D, I guess, makes skin darker. To make a long story short, my mother grew up in an orphanage in the 1930s, and because uh, of how old I am, and they didn't know why they did certain things, but they did certain things. And the certain things they did were they would give the students yeast, the students, the children, yeast pills, and they just thought their stomachs seemed to be better when they gave them yeast pills. Now, today you hear about uh, bacteria, good bacteria, what yogurt has this, et cetera. Back then, it just gave children yeast pills. But they also gave the children a spoonful of cod liver oil every day. And of course, I take that too. But cod liver oil is high in vitamin D. If you take a lot of cod liver oil, your body's going to think you're in the sun more and your skin's going to get darker. 
And this was an interesting thing. Like when I grew up, there was uh, in the 1970s, you know, they teach so many different things. They taught about um, different races of people. And then we got away from race. And now we seem to be going back to race, et cetera. But, you know, we all can breed with each other. But um, they had uh, the idea that some people in the 1970s and 1960s really didn't think that uh, one race could have come from someone else. And when they had the original idea that uh, the first people were probably more black than white, white people had this idea that perhaps that isn't how it happened. And they said, no, as people went north, they got less sun, they got lighter. It's not like if you were black and you went to Nova Scotia, you'd get completely white. But over a long, long, long period of time, I guess you get lighter. And what the people would say in contrast is, well, there's very little light on the Eskimos, and the Eskimos are extremely dark people, so that just ruins that entire theory. But Eskimos do not have any farms. It's just too cold up there, and they eat so much fish, they get so much vitamin D, their body thinks there's a lot of sunlight. That's a slightly interesting talk. Okay, so, and then finally, uh, let's see, one more fat-soluble one. By the way, you could overdose on vitamin D, that's fat-soluble. One more fat-soluble one would be, um, I suppose, vitamin E. As far as I'm going to go with this letter out there, good for the cardiovascular system. And let's see, uh, blood thinning, thins bloods a little bit. Um, this kind of antioxidant, there are different things in there too. So now we're gonna switch over to just general nutrition terms. This is more the nutrition chapter. After this comes the drug chapter. That's not in today, although we do deal with some drugs. You just wanna have a balanced diet above all. You don't wanna be missing anything. And everybody's different. You have to figure out yourself. That's the hardest part. What you need might be different than the amount of calories and the amount of things that other people need. And they probably are. So let's go back here. Under general nutrition. First of all, fewer calories is good. But having no calories, you'd starve to death. So obviously there's a certain amount of calories. But today's foods are rich in fats and calories. Those are the ones that we think taste good. Out of curiosity, mice with 40% fewer calories live longer. than mice who can have as much food as they want, I imagine, and have less tumors. If you think about what a tumor is, it's a bunch of cells that are growing and feeding. Um, they have to feed. They need some serious amount of food. So um, I would think that you're giving more nutrition to the tumor sometimes. Uh, what else can we say about that? So that's 40% less than mice who just were given the open feed trough and told, have fun, you know, not told anything, but just given the open feed trough. Now, less fat and more starch is good. And obviously, if you were diabetic, you have to watch your insulin, not insulin, you have to watch your glucose, which is dealt with with your insulin to make a long story short, your body needs to be able to, well, you know more about that than I do if you had these laboratories, but um, your body needs to be able to process the glucose sugar. But um, more starch in general for a healthy person and less fat. The example the book uses is Chinese people consume 20% more calories, 
but in general are thinner. Rice, not only trying to people are not only eating rice, and uh, this is actually probably not even good to say anymore because uh, so much changes. A good example is World War II. America in the 1940s fought the Japanese, and the Japanese man, the average man, was like five foot two, five foot three. Today, the average Japanese man is five foot seven. They started taking Western diets, but they also have some of our diseases they didn't have before. So it's, you know, it, it's, I'm not sure. The Chinese people have really come a long way recently, but the concept was if you had more starch and less fat, you were better off. Okay, so let's look at the history of fats. I got a, a little notes that I updated, I think. History of consuming meat in America. That might be interesting. How many pounds of meat and what type of meat the average American eats over the years? So let's see. First of all, we have year, and then we have red meat eaten in pounds, and that's going to be pork and beef. And then poultry in pounds again, and that's chicken and turkey. You really don't want to talk about duck because duck is so fatty. It's a long story. We talked about duck wax before. And then finally fish. Does that really mean? Oh, it depends how you feel about it. So let's see what the average American has been doing. 1971, we ate 150 LBS of red meat a year, 48 LBS pounds of chicken and turkey, and 12 pounds of fish. Fish is so good for you. Fish has, um, well, I mean, you, whatever you decide is good for you. I don't want to say something because maybe you don't want to eat fish. You feel bad about killing the fish. I understand that, etc. All that stuff is quite cruel. Uh, but fish has um, so many of these essential oils you need in them, like we talked about the vitamin D and stuff you get from them. 1981, Americans were down to 134 LBS. But we were up to 60 pounds of chicken and turkey. So I think what it is, is we really want a certain amount of meat in our diet. And we were willing to pull back on this one because we were afraid of starting to have more health effects. And it is probably healthier to eat a chicken. Now, I always say this before, but the chickens that I grew up with that had exercised, I had always thought we, we would get, I think I told you this before, but we'd get... Uh, probably 100 laying birds and 50 meat birds and we'd uh, kill the 50 meat birds first or i would kill the 50 meat birds first and they were always so tough and then when we killed the laying birds you know we killed half of them when they went into molt where they weren't laying eggs during that period of time and uh, by the end of the year i had killed 150 chickens and my mother would clean them we had a wood stove it's very strange no hot water long time ago long 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 time ago but make a long story short, I always thought that chicken was extremely tough, I think I told you. And I grew up 30 miles from the ocean. I never really saw the ocean. And I'd never been to McDonald's. So when I went to McDonald's later in life, I couldn't believe that chicken was soft and chicken was easy to eat. That's because most of our chicken, we graze inside of these cages that's extremely cruel and never get to exercise. So when they say chicken is healthy to eat, if it's a free-range chicken, it's probably healthy to eat, but boy, it's going to be much more chewy. And uh, the stuff that's, uh, some of those animals, those meat birds are gigantic. I mean, when I was a kid, chickens would fly five acres across our farm. It was really amazing what they could do. They could fly. So um, pretty amazing creatures. 
Anyway, fish, we were still at 13 LBS. So I think people who like fish like fish, and nobody was jumping into fish at that point. Moving forward, 1991, I think by then we started listening. 119 pounds of red meat, 81 LBS of poultry, and oh boy, 15 LBS of fish. By 1991, we started to get like a little bit decent more money. So we just like ate more food a lot of times. But if you notice, we might be cutting back on the red meat, but we're really pushing up our amount of um, poultry that we're eating. And now these are the numbers I have. 2001, 118 pounds. So we kind of decided we are not going to give up on hamburgers. 95, we're just eating more and more. I guess we're getting bored and still 15 LBS. So many of our diseases come from overnutrition. And then finally, let's try, I'll do 2016, it's the last one I had fish numbers on. 2016, we're down to 107 pounds of red meat. 91 pounds, so now we're cutting back a little bit on poultry, and still 15 pounds of LBS fish. So something to take away from this is we probably should eat more fish, one word back. Let's see where we're at so far. Okay. Probably a good place to take a break.